S in Hell, a look back at Saturday Night Live with your hosts, Matt and Keith. Brought to you by Lion's Den Audio Theater. Like and subscribe to Lion's Den Audio Theater for more Lion's Den goodness. And here are your hosts, Keith and Matt. Saturday Night Live, Season 3, Episode 14, starring Jill Clayburgh, originally aired on March 18th, 1978. Welcome to SN Hell. My name is Keith. With me, as always, my good buddy, Matt. Hello, Matt. Hello. How are things tonight, my friend? Pretty good. Pretty good. You know, for the record, Matt and I don't talk much about the show. We hardly talk at all beyond scheduling, eh, Matt, other than when we're on the on the uh, air here. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we shoot the shit about the, uh, the, the media itself, the media, the medium, and various gossip about the performers, which I always enjoy, swapping interviews and old retro pics of Martin Short or something. Someone asked what other SNL related podcasts do you listen to? Um, I, you're, you're nothing, right? You don't listen to anything else. We, we are the only one. Just listen. Okay, yeah. I, I listen to a few. I try to avoid anything we haven't covered. Like there's, uh, you know, there's there's a couple that are going through things. And if we've already done the show, I might give it a listen. I think it's awesome. There's so many out there. A lot of different opinions floating around about different things. And it, it's remarkable, too, how other hosts uh, and us are landing on some of the same conclusions, despite doing our things in isolation, right? That is pretty interesting. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I listen to podcasts every night. I go to bed, yeah. I put on a podcast. But uh, other than listening to Live from New York as an audio book, I've never mm-hmm. listened to anything Saturday Night Live related. That week in SNL is one I, I listen to their episodes after, like quite a while after we've done ours. Mm-hmm. So like, anything from season three, I won't listen to it right now. Fly on the Wall, uh, that's Dana Carvey and David Spade's podcast. They do a lot of really neat interviews. Um, my favorite so far is the, uh, the the Jim Downey interview. That's kind of tailor made for your interest areas because it it really focuses on this early stage and then uh, a big jump from like when Carvey joins up until when McDonald leaves. So it's like your two hot spots really. Ooh, that does sound really up my alley. I'll make it a priority because that's that's really what I'd be looking for. Like I, I want to hear some historical perspective, maybe some you know good stories about the past. If they're just there, like promoting new projects and joking about the modern world, uh, I'm, I'd be less inclined. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, very much history. so. Yeah, and and you know to be honest, Carvey to some extent, extent Spade, but Carvey uh, occasionally just goes off in these joke rants that <laughs> kind of take me out of the interview a little bit, but it's still well worth listening. to. I've read several, while I've not heard it myself yet, I've read several online criticisms of said sidebars. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think the point of it, too, is still to showcase some of their comedy, you know, and, and Kirby's <laughs> impressions are great. It's not like you're listening to a, you know, a shit impressionist, right? <laughs> yeah, really. It's one of the best in the game. Also, Ian talks comedy. Really good stuff. He's got... Uh, a lot of Saturday Night Live folks and writers and such, and a little bit on Night Court as well. And then some other stuff, too. He's He's got interviews with uh, Marilyn. Well, I mean, just tons of interviews, but the ones that really stood out for me based on what we're doing is there's one with Marilyn Miller and Rosie Schuster together. It's one I really like. There's one with Neil Levy or Levy. And I uh, really enjoy that podcast as well. One thing somebody said to us that they really like, especially with you, you don't get any free passes. It might be Dan and Lorraine and Garrett and 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 Jane and a sketch and you love all four of them but you're not going to just love the sketch because you love the people that are in it no, I don't either but I mean you really have a impress me fool type thing <laughs> you know <laughs> consider the painting before us yeah <laughs> So uh, with us tonight is, is is nobody. However, Matt and I are going to plow on uh, with just the two of us at this point in time, which is a different for a different thing for us. It's it's been uh, I, I don't think we've done this since the Desi Arnaz episode. The show must go on. So what the heck is up with Jill Clayburgh? Since her last appearance, she'd had she'd appeared in some successful projects: uh, Silver Streak with Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor, uh, Semi Tough with Burt Reynolds. And uh, she'd released a film earlier in March called An Unmarried Woman that would go on to really propel her to uh, A-list. And she'd get like an Oscar nomination, Golden Globe nomination. I think she'd also win the award at Cannes for that. So she was a, a pretty big name for a while there after that role. Um, things declined a bit later, as it tends to do for a lot of 
you know, Oscar winners. At this point, she is just at the crest of a white hot streak for herself. I had no idea she was so accomplished. What do kids that are like 15 now know about Holly Hunter? If- oh, yeah, I know what you mean. You know what I'm saying? I do with that, that, that hit. So our musical. What do I know about Holly Hunter? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know much about Holly Hunter either, either than that she was highly acclaimed and I don't hear her name as much as I used to. So a musical guest, Eddie Money. We'll talk about Eddie a bit later. Two little notes. One thing I keep meaning to mention, it keeps finding its way off my notes, is this year Belushi is not a writer on the show. I know that's not worth, like, I know that's not worth much beyond just a trivia thing because he's certainly still contributing to the uh, to the sketches. Animal House comes out, like, later this year, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the movie American Hot Wax? Yes, I have heard of it. I have not seen it. It's the story of uh, Alan Freed. Well, it's a fictitious version of the life of Alan. Well, not even the life, but a period of the career of Alan Freed, the Cleveland disc jockey credited by most to be the person to invent the term rock and roll. That movie opened on March 17th, 78, the night before this airing. Now, here's what's interesting. Lorraine is one of the main characters in the movie. And yet... No mention at all on Saturday Night Live. That's pretty slack. Why don't you promote your uh, the big hit movie? Maybe they ran commercials that we're not seeing. Maybe, maybe. But I find that's a Saturday Night Live thing as we go on. Like, some things do get promoted and some things do not. Maybe it's, uh, I mean, it's Lauren's call, right? Of course he's going to promote things he's involved with. But, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you want eyes on the product? Yeah, on one of your people. Like, that's where it always twists with me. Wouldn't it be sort of a, a joint promotion type thing? Sad. Maybe you and I can watch Hot Wax and talk to the uh, thousands about it this summer. Yeah, for sure. I'm down. Disclaimer. Bowling for medicine will not be seen tonight. So we can bring you this special presentation. We now go to the cold open. And we have Garrett dressed as a leprechaun sitting on a mushroom. And he sings Danny Boy. And there's some... Irish background singers behind him who are also dressed as leprechauns. There's the typical crawl that comes up, except this one is written by Garrett. He doesn't mind the crawl, but he doesn't like that people are laughing over the words and missing his singing. So he's written his own that takes up space, but it isn't important text. He mentions that they got the leprechaun costume and the mushrooms for 40% off because today is the day after St. Patrick's Day. And he then says he's going to hold the final note of Oh Danny Boy until the word crawl ends. To me, this was both a very beautiful version of a very beautiful song. I thought it was excellent. It ties in really well to it being St. Patrick's Day. But I thought it was a great joke that because it's the day after St. Patrick's Day, they get the uh, they get the stuff for 40% off. Big kudos to the awesome sounding and aptly looking background singers. I love this cold open. Yeah, me too. I, I really liked it. And yeah, that's pretty funny because, you know, the, the day after Easter, the day after Valentine's Day, you know, I'm at the Shoppers Drug Mart grabbing up whatever I can. Uh, did Garrett actually write it? I doubt it. Fair enough. Anyway, yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. It was the best one of these uh, I've seen. This is also, uh, incidentally, Garrett's first solo live from New York since the Richard Pryor episode. That's been a while. It has been a while. He he had it coming. He deserves it. Monologue. Jill Claiborne comes down to a, just a huge response. You can tell she's more than just somebody they dug up for the week <laughs> based on the response. She mentions that when she saw the repeat of her last show, she wasn't happy with her monologue because she didn't prepare it as well as she could have. And she confesses that she didn't learn her lesson because this time she didn't work on it either. So she said if they ever have her back, she'll do it then. They never have her back, so I get what they were going for. It didn't work for me, though. I mean, it was short, though. I'll give it that. Yeah, I got to give it something. I mean, at least write something for her, though. Don't send her out there in that awful floppy blue sweater that she looked terrible in. And also, maybe I just don't remember properly, but she looks 15 years older to, to me than I remember her looking the first time. But yeah, there was, there was nothing here. There was no jokes. They were just like, make a joke about the fact that you don't have anything prepared. Uh, I don't know. Write something for your person this week. What are you, what are you doing? We now see a rerun. It's the Royal Deluxe 2, and this is re-aired from the first episode of this season, Steve Martin and Jackson Brown. It's the one where the rabbi circumcises the baby in the back of the car to show how smooth the ride is. If I recall, I really enjoyed this. You didn't so much, but uh, this one's a classic that I used to see on all the greatest hits reels. What you think this time around? I pretty much feel the same. It's so long. It's just the same joke the whole time. We're now off to the Olympia Cafe. 
a phone order comes in for, you know, cheeseburger, chips, and Pepsi. Lorraine is there trying to train Jill. Garrett, who plays a patron, mentions to Pete, played by John Belushi, that there's a new waitress. And John says she won't be staying long because she'll eventually be wanting money. Pete slips out for a minute. Lorraine and Jill watch the cash register. Jane comes in as a local and asks Bill, who, as we know, cannot speak English very well, if she can hang a poster for a benefit in the window. Now, Pete enters. He'll only let Jane hang the poster if she buys something. They do the whole cheeseburger, cheeseburger, or actually cheeseburger, cheeseburger thing. And Pete also tries to teach Jill how to say cheeseburger. Jill gets frustrated and tries to storm out. Jane tries to calm her down and ask for a glass of water. Pete says no water, Pepsi. The audience wasn't digging this thing, and is this was, you know, not the greatest Olympia Cafe. But I was wondering how much the background music, there was a bazooki playing in the background, and this might be all Python influenced here, but I was wondering how much the bazooki was throwing the audience off. I don't remember them using that before, but it seems like partway through the sketch, the music got quieter. And the audience really started to get back into it. I don't know if it was distracting or whatever. Uh, still good. I enjoyed this. This is not what the previous uh, Olympia Cafe has been. Uh, and this, uh, and there'll be later ones that are better than this. I certainly liked it more the last time as well. I, I got a laugh. I, I wrote down in my notes, imagine workers wanting money. That's crazy. <laughs> Uh, Dan and Bill, I find really good in their roles, but I really thought there was kind of a snail's pace to it. It was well produced. I there was uh, I, I did like it felt for a minute or two there. It was just felt very slice of life, 70s New York for yeah a minute or two there. I, I was really into it and I thought it was really cool, despite not being particularly funny, except when he said, OK, T, I know that guy had a good <laughs> laugh at me. <laughs> I find these hard, like I've, I've seen a few of these over the years and, and I've watched ahead. I find these hard to not like, even when they're not laugh riots. Yeah, everybody's uh, into them. I didn't even realize, like Jill Claver really uh, is good at disappearing into these little roles that they give her mm-hmm. on the sketches. They're not afraid to use her in these, which I think speaks to uh, their, their trust in her. Yeah, she, she has the chops for sure. Our next one is Sybil 3, I think they're calling it. It's a parody of the Sybil movie from 76 that starred uh, Sally Field and Joanne Woodward. I remember this used to be Sybil used to be on the uh, the A&E afternoon movie block where they show like the same eight movies. You know, if you watched A&E in the afternoon on the weekends, you were going to, you know, eventually you were going to see Charlie Varick again and Three Fugitives. (laughs) So the Sybil movie was one that was really it was about uh one of a few that was about split personalities and, and whatnot. It was probably the biggest one of that time. So this is a parody of that. Jill is a psychologist or psychiatrist. She brings in Jane, Gild, and Lorraine and accuses them of being one person with a split personality. She seems to have come to this conclusion because all three women are named Sybil. There used to be 13 more Sybils that, that came with them who stopped coming, but Jill takes that as a sign of success. Jane and Lorraine are annoyed, but Gilda's Sybil is sort of a version of her catatonic Colleen Furman character. Jane and Lorraine reveal that they both received ice water enemas from their abusive mothers. Jill tells the three women to go lay on the couch. All three try, but Gilda gets knocked off, and that's quite funny. And Jill turns her back and starts talking about herself. Jane and Lorraine then decide to sneak out of the appointment. Jill turns around, sees Gilda, and thinks she's cured because there's only one left. And then uh, Jill calls for Deborah to be sent in, and a whole whack of women, including Gilda, who got caught up in the crowd, get pulled in. I thought this was a brilliant idea, uh, kind of a parody of split personality being multiple people. This was a really nice one for the women, and I know that these three women like each other and liked working together, so that's always nice. Nice touch at the end with Gilda being caught up in the crowd of Deborah's and coming back in. I had no problems with this and and really thought the idea of a silly psychiatrist or psychologist mistaking three people with the same name for one person was a great way of... uh, taking off Sybil. It was pretty good. Uh, I really like the spin that the, the the shrink is quite 
mad actually <laughs> compared to uh the people there uh, th- there was kind of a bit to unpack here uh they called gilda sybil vegged out which yeah. uh, i was like ah, is she supposed to be playing a mentally handicapped person i thought that was a little uncomfortable um i mean she does good physical comedy but I don't really know what they're going for with her character here. And uh, by our modern standards, it certainly runs quite a fine line. As well, the, you know, the ladies just shooting the shit about being physically abused by their moms is oh. a bit uh, uh, a bit of like a, hey uh Jill uh, was really nailing her character, uh, in my opinion. I really liked her commitment <laughs> to oh. S- Sybil being the, the, this this composite person, uh, even though they're there. And then the whole thing on the couch, when they were all trying to fit on the couch, uh, there was some really good physical comedy in this. The host was great. They, they definitely were walking a fine line as far as taste, but uh, they, they didn't fall too far over the other side. Some of them are absolutely ridiculous, even though they didn't plan to be. These psychological movies, movies from the 70s about psychology now, when you rewatch them today under what, what we've learned since then, how absolutely ridiculous they are. Sybil's one that apparently still holds up well to a degree. If you look at it as as, as parodying the genre more than parodying the the condition, I think uh, I think even by today's standards, it it'd fly. However, Gilda's Colleen is is definitely one of the more touchier things we, we keep running across. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. And th- and that's very fair. I don't know the context of the pictures either, but I do know there was like a, a slight media mania about split personalities and things like that. You yeah. know, there were there were, there was lots of TV movies. There was one of them on every soap opera on the air. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. We now go to bad one man theater, and I don't know if I've mentioned this before. But all these bad, like the Leonard Pinth Garnell things, they're all written by Tom Schiller. Kudos there. We've liked we've liked them up to this point. So again, we have Dan as Leonard Pinth Garnell. And tonight's bad subject is monodrama. So that's basically one man shows, one person shows. They were quite big at this time. Um, they mentioned a few in here, but the two that really went for a while and people were really huge on were uh, Hal Holbrook's Mark Twain and Evening with Mark Twain. And uh, James Whitmore's Give Him Hell Harry. We get to see some bad one-man theater. And it's Tom Schiller as Mark Twain. John Belushi as Harry Truman. Bill Murray as Edgar Allan Poe. Garrett as Paul Robeson. And Jane as Eleanor Roosevelt. They go through one by one. And each starts their sort of monologue until all five are talking. Dan has to quiet them down with a bullhorn. He then introduced the cast. And of course we have Steve Bouchakis playing Harry Truman and our, our, our very own Ronnie Bateman as Edgar Allan Poe. And then Dan of course drops the play bill for the play in the garbage. To me, this was really, really funny. Each impression was quite good. This is not as good as some other entries of the bad series have been, but I, I still enjoyed this. I really like the impressions uh, each uh, each person did. Bill did a, a bit on Weekend Update in one of his first Weekend Updates about uh, the one-man show and such like that. But uh, I enjoyed this, but not top-tier bad, but still pretty darn good. I, I certainly didn't like it as much as you. I, I did like the impressions, but I, other than you know them getting a, their spots in, so to speak, to do their, uh, their gimmick, their voice, I really didn't think there was a lot of uh, oomph to it. Uh, though I did really like Dan's delivery, and I especially liked Arlo Guthrie is Hirohito in words and music. <laughs> I want to see that. Do you like Arlo Guthrie? No, not really. <laughs> oh, okay. Nor do I like Hirohito. No, no, let's get that clear. I didn't even ask. I assumed I shouldn't. <laughs> we now go to the first musical performance of the night. It's Eddie Money. Eddie Money was born in New York, but moved to California at a young age, and he kind of came out of the san francisco music scene he released his first album eddie money in 77 it hit 33 on the billboard charts the first performance was baby hold on it's from the eddie money album it hit number 11 uh released in december 77 this is a well-known song uh definitely gives energetic and a spirited performance compared to a lot of the stuff we've seen on the show. Now, this totally isn't for me. Um, it's it's very much in vain with a lot of the stuff we haven't really enjoyed too much. But there, there was something different enough about that that it 
felt kind of fresh. Maybe it was just the, the sheer energy to it or, or, or money's voice. You know, this is to me, this is the dad rock that you talk about, but uh, it's got some spunk to it. Um, I definitely put this at middle or upper, upper middle of the pack for the season. You know, maybe this is AM radio, but it's, it's nighttime instead of morning drive, Matt. You know damn well I like this. You know damn well. Like, this is this is practically hard rock after what we've been getting used to on the show. And I mean, the, the, the song is fun. Uh, Eddie looks like he feels really good tonight. Yeah. He is loose. Eddie is the one who is loose tonight. <laughs> I appreciate it. It was super upbeat. It was fun. Good energy. And it was different. Eddie Money is not on the algorithm. Uh, of the white dad rock that we've seen so far but i totally understand uh what you mean by saying it's dad rock but at least it's like divorced cool dad rock okay (laughs) but you know something else that came to me like we're talking about dad rock okay the dads we talk about as dad rocks that listen to this were in their 20s at that point it's a genre unto itself we now go to a commercial that i forgot even existed i don't remember ever seeing it before um but i have seen this episode before so i don't know maybe it was cut this is Nutrifix, and it's America's fastest instant breakfast. Jane plays a mother who says her family struggles to find a quick and nutritious instant breakfast. Flakes, shakes, powders, and bars didn't work. She found Nutrifix, which is an injectable breakfast that comes in five flavors. It includes amphetamines for that extra boost. So Lorraine and John come in as the children, and Dan comes in as the dad. And they all get shots in the glute. These are very painful shots that uh, they certainly react to uh, with, with, with a loud kind of grunty scream. The effects of this breakfast are instant energy because Lorraine cartwheels out the door and Dan says he can now go to work without his car. Jane, left alone, takes a bunch of shots herself. I loved this. I laughed my head off through the whole thing. I I. I'm surprised it hasn't actually hit the market yet in real life. Yeah, what an interesting product. I thought Jane was uh, Jane's great as the modern woman in these uh, commercials. The modern go-getter. Not, I shouldn't say go-getter, but you know what I mean. The modern woman in 1978. Uh, I thought it was hilarious that it seemed like it had to be in the ass until uh, she was uh, finishing herself off later. How did she taste it when she got a shot in her ass? Uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, I, why, I wrote, why is it a rush and it hurts for a minute? It's, uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. The breakfast you bang. That's, uh, that's a pretty edgy sketch. That's good late night TV. Is this sketch like infinitely funnier because the shot hurts? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's important that it does. Yeah. yeah. I was watching it and the, the, the grunt yell thing made all the difference in the world sort of brought it from like, you know, a very good thing to an excellent thing for me. Just the fact that it hurt them. (laughs) (laughs) We now have a Chiron and this person uh, gets by on looks alone. We're now off to weekend update. And this is brought to us by Solomon X sleeping pill for wise Jewish Kings. And what better way to start off weekend update than with a Roman Polanski joke. It's a picture of somebody kissing a little girl. Just a few things I picked up. Phillies might not be allowed to run in the Kentucky Derby, but they will be allowed to come in the stadium and make coffee for the male horses. There's a funny joke in there about a horse with VD going clippity-clap. Lorraine is in a mine with a federal mine inspector played by Al Franken. He talks about safety and says that he feels the mines are as safe as possible just as the mine caves in on them. Incidentally, this was a really neat set that was used for about 15 seconds. Billy Carter's Billy Beer isn't doing well. But the GOP has gone on to develop Donald Beer after Nixon's little brother. Jane reads a poem from China that is said to have Eastern wisdom, but it's just a dirty limerick. Roseanne Rosanna Dana does a bit about taxes, uh, talks about uh, getting dressed nice to meet an IRS agent, but her blouse stank. She talked about a smelly kid she knew in school. She grosses the Jane out and tells a story about a rabbit that kind of ties everything together. This was the longest Roseanne Rosanna Dana, um, but there were some laughs in there. This was not great, not horrible. Audience is all in, especially for Roseanne, who uh, has quickly become a huge hit. Dan's contribution was almost nothing. He's not even at the desk at the end. Another uh, 
substandard weekend update, I think. And and I am tiring of Roseanne already. Yeah, it was a bit old for me, too. I'm always up for a good dig at Roman Polanski. And there was just the usual topical jokes. I thought the mine cutaway was the best joke they've had in a while. Uh, that was really funny. Dan sucks at this. Like, I, I don't know why they keep rolling him out there. If he doesn't want to be there and he's not good at it. I hate the Nixon jokes. I'm really finished with them. I wish they'd go away. Fantasy Island joke. Uh, with Ricardo Montalban was Fantasy Island on the air already? Did they? Did we, yep. Was that was that a Fantasy Island joke? Okay. Yep. My mom's favorite was Roseanne Rosanna Dana, so I think I, she's a sentimental favorite. I do find the wig pretty comical. Like when I came out and saw its geometric shape, uh, I got a laugh. But it, it's just relying on her delivery so much. Uh, I didn't really feel like the material was very strong. Uh, like her disdain for Fernando was pretty funny, but uh, once again, I was Jane Curtin in this. Scale sketch exasperated and frustrated for the most part and i wish they'd just give her weekend update back like yeah we now go to blurry john belushi plays a sort of cowboy type jill plays his uh seat mate on a, a bus and they're passing by the grand canyon and jill asks if he wants to look out he doesn't look out at the grand canyon because it's just so blurry John talks about all the fancy places he's been and all the beautiful things he's seen, but he's never been impressed because everything's way too blurry and all out of focus. He says he's never fallen in love with any woman except his wife, who is the most beautiful woman in the world, and he shows her a picture. It's a blurry picture. He even finds himself to be ill-defined and blurry. Jill suggests he go to an eye doctor, and she gives him her glasses to try on, and he's angry because everything is even more blurry, and he accuses her of making fun of him. He goes to move and asks if uh, yeah, he asks people on the bus if anyone's sitting next to them when they obviously are. He then goes back to Jill and asks if anybody's sitting next to her. And there's not because it was his seat. This was great. Really simple concept. Nice and short. I thought Belushi was really good. And Jill, though, it wasn't a big, uh, big, big really part for her beyond line delivery. Um, I thought she was fine. I really enjoyed this. This was a low key, well crafted piece. And it kind of had a kids in the hall vibe to me. Yeah, I agree. It was pretty cute. I, I mean, I wrote it. It's easy to pick up on it early. Like, oh, he just needs glasses. But he keeps delivering the lines so sincerely. Like, women everywhere are all the same, all fuzzy looking and out of focus. <laughs> and his uh, his expression was so good. And I, I do feel like there was some wasted potential uh, a little bit. But I still, I liked it. Yeah. Shower Mike 2. This is the second Shower Mike. This was written by Bill Murray tom davis a couple of others as well bill murray as uh, richard herkeman joins his wife jane in the shower and of course he uh, takes the soap on the rope in the shape of a microphone and he starts hosting his own talk show well he keeps trying to get her to sing love will keep us together she's too shy his guest for that day is next door neighbor morty who just stopped by to tell some jokes after his wife had thrown him out naturally gilda's jane is very embarrassed but uh, Morty goes on to tell some bad jokes. Bill then surprises Morty with his wife, Judy, played by Jill Clayberg. They all get back together in the shower. Everyone sings Love Will Keep Us Together. I enjoyed this. I mean, I don't think I'm big on these uh, shower mic things, but there's a ton of energy in them. And, and there is something hilariously absurd about them. It's charming, but it's not like ha ha funny, which I think is where it suffers. It's just uh, the performances are all great. Bill and Gilda and Belushi, they were all great. And uh, Jill really blends in, I find, just throughout this episode with the cast. She's doing a good job. Uh, but yeah, it was just like a nice bit of charm. It didn't really have any good jokes other than them, you know, singing in the shower, uh, which was cute unto itself. But, eh, you know, it's not going to be our favorite. No, we now have a Chiron woman was caught on guard. We now go to the Coneheads on Earth. This is a rare bit where the Coneheads happen later in the show. So Jill starts to sketch in bed where she's talking to somebody in another room. She says she just split with her old man and hadn't done this before, but she fell for whoever this man is because she found him special. Excuse me. The man is revealed to be Beldar Conehead. Beldar is leaving because he doesn't want Primat to discover what he's been up to. We then cut to the Conehead's house. Primat and Connie are discussing Connie getting ready for a date. Beldar enters and Primat is annoyed that he came home late for supper. Beldar says he was delayed by a meteorite that fell from the sky. Primat notes that it's the third one that month. And she figures out that Beldar was with a human female. Connie enters and the conversation stops and the trio consume mass quantities of beer, insect repellent, and pink fiberglass insulation. 
Bill shows up as Ronnie uh, and says they're going to go see Close Encounters, and he takes several six-packs. Somebody named Jerry then calls Primat, implying that she's running around on him, too. They decide to avoid uh, further interactions with inferior humans. Beldar understands why people would like Primat, because she gives good cone. A few laughs here and there. This is definitely the worst cone heads I've seen. This might be the first one where they're saying Mebs a lot, which is kind of their curse word. Definitely not the quality the other Coneheads have been for me. I agree. I thought it was the worst. It was certainly my least favorite to date. I was surprised that it starts out with Beldar being an adulterer, but he had a good line with, Prima must not discover that a human has administered the sensor rings. I got a <laughs> kick out of that. Jill is really good again. She's a good actress, that Jill. And Jane's I Hate Housework apron is amazing and was the highlight of the sketch. We now go to Celebrity Crack Up, and I think this was originally written for the Chevy chase uh episode because this was the one where chevy and bill apparently weren't working well together um or at least that was the name of the sketch jane hosts a show where celebrities reveal their deepest secrets we have bill as tony orlando john as robert blake gilda as claudine langer and garrett as richard pryor so tony orlando has bipolar and he's lost a lot of people that were close to him or a lot of people he thought were close to him, at least. Uh, the most re- recent death, of course, was Chaplin. Belushi talks about remembering Chaplin from his days as a little rascal. He does a bit about public being life and life being public, and time is money, and you can take that to the bank. Really Robert Blakeish. I, I did enjoy that. Garrett, as Richard Pryor, talks about an incident where he kicked people out of his house and shot up their car. Claudine, after a few interjections, talks about just shooting someone in the stomach as a solution for problems. And Tony talks more about his manic depression. Claudine Langer's sketch from season one, it was still the thing I found least tasteful on the show thus far. So that was a mark against it. Bill's costume was hilarious looking, and I thought he was instantly recognizable as Tony Orlando. Uh, Belushi was, in a strange way, only wearing a black T-shirt, but he was definitely had the Robert Blake vibes. There were a couple of uh, micro expressions in there that definitely gave it off. Garrett's not an impersonator at all. Uh, Richard Pryor, again, not really a hard one to do, but Garrett wasn't even close. And Claudine Langer is basically Gilda with an accent. Here's my problem with this, and this is a real big problem I had with this. Again, this is making fun of people who were dealing with really serious issues. It was definitely kicking people while they were down. Um, so we had like mental health, drug addiction, um, a murder, which may have been an accidental killing. These were really cheap shots, and I wasn't partic- I wasn't happy with this at all. The, the good parts of this sketch were so minute compared to the overall mean-spirited of this one i really didn't like this it, i didn't like it either don't get me wrong some of it was lost on me certainly compared to you but uh i mean i, I did right i wasn't into the jokes and uh, i assume you know you, you need to be able to relate a little more to the characters and their history slash identity uh, for some of this to really land and i didn't really have a lot of you know information about you know i don't know what's going on with tony orlando i don't know what's going on with richard Pryor. i didn't even know who gilda was doing so this whole thing was just a swoosh for me chiron losing this person's losing their fight for privacy We then go to Two Tickets to Paradise. This is probably Eddie Money's signature song. Much better music. Love the music performance here. But (laughs) they did a four square camera thing with an overlay of money in the center. Brought me right back to the uh, local telethons of the mid 90s. And it was outdated then. You know, I was waiting for a star swipe or something. They have effed around with (laughs) the camera during musical acts before. I don't know if this is an artist request or just the guys in the booth saying, let's have some fun. Strangely, charmingly 70s as well. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. I didn't know we were going to get to hear Two Tickets to Paradise. I thought it came out a little later. And I got a real kick out of the production effects. They made me laugh because they were so painfully late 70s. And uh, I thought they were hilarious and good for an act like this. It's just out here, fun, having a good time. That bongo player really having a good time. Fun song, good energy, and I really needed i needed a change in the musical performances lately. I've been miserable, and this was right up my alley. Nice, nice. I'm glad. I think you always get right to the point where you're ready to quit the podcast because of the music, and then something like this comes along and says, okay, this is why I'm doing it. <laughs> it does feel like that, doesn't it? It's this <laughs> year's Santana. Come. 20 years till Annie Lennox type. <laughs> a little <laughs> check mark on the wall. 
Uh, now we go to uh, a song. It's uh, Jill, accompanied by Cheryl Hardwick on piano. She recites a poem, sings a song, kind of a hybrid thing, um, about being overly agreeable to a guy and making concessions to a fellow up to the point where he's doing things that just really piss her off, but you, she realizes she loves the guy just because he's around. Not particularly funny, extremely well-performed, a nice spot, nice thing to do at the end. This is definitely the type of thing that was really popular and on the rise at the that point and it goes through bits and pieces where this sort of cabaret act will will peak and 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 then drop in popularity for a while i i enjoyed this but it's not it wasn't you know laugh riot stuff i thought she was good and and i did expect her to sing because she she had done some music the last time and certainly preferred this to her uh her sea cruise from her first time around yeah sure she's got a pretty voice but i didn't really see the point of this so it wasn't like she's just complaining about a dude who doesn't really sound like that bad of a dude i thought it was blissfully short i it really seemed like filler to me like they know she can sing get her out there to sing mm-hmm. a song which she does just fine but yeah, I wasn't into it. All right, so that uh, we get to the good nights. Cast looks nice, nice and friendly. I said this is a happy cast good night, and somebody throws an orange to Jill. I, I don't know if that was a cast member or if it just came from the audience. Yeah, here's an orange. Let's rate this show now. So our host, Jill Clayberg, she's a different kind of host. She's uh, not particularly funny, but she's excellent at, like you said, Matt, disappearing into these characters and certainly playing some degree of normal so everyone else can be crazy around her. For a lot of sketches, anyone could have done the part, but I don't think many of our hosts so far could have played it as well. Didn't like the monologue. I do think that hosts like this at times are refreshing to see on the show, and we definitely don't see as many today as we did over the years, where it's basically somebody here, like I said, to be the normal person or the straight person and let everyone just be wacky around them. Um, I thought she's different, but I, I liked her. Yeah, I thought she did a really good job. She really, I always appreciate a host that disappears into the cast. And she did. She didn't do anything that was like super standout, but they used her as like a utility player in a bunch of sketches. I really appreciated her as the psychologist in that Sylvia sketch. And uh, yeah, I thought, I thought she did quite well. The music, Eddie Money. When Eddie Money comes on the radio, I never turn it off ever but i've never gone looking for eddie money i know i've said that about others before but it's probably more true of eddie money than it has been of anyone else the musical performances were good high energy and and a a nice change camera work in two tickets of paradise probably gave me my biggest laugh of the night definitely won't be in the top for me this year but pretty darn good i mean the way we've been going it might be in the top for me yeah. Uh, I, I did think it was good energy. It was such a breath of fresh air, good change of pace, upbeat music, people having a good time. Yeah, it was feel good on a Saturday night. Worst sketch of the night. Worst sketch of the night for me was, I mean, I don't even want to call it a sketch, but it was the worst thing they did was that very last one with uh, Jill out there singing. Okay. For me, it was the celebrity crack up. I found it long meandering and mean spirited. Oh shit! I changed my yeah. answer. Uh, that was that. Yeah, that was exceptionally bad, and it was way too long. And uh, at the time I watched it, I was like, I don't fucking get this. But you know, in, uh, some recent revelations have revealed how quite mean spirited it is. And uh, no thanks. All right. And what was your best sketch of the night, Matt? It was the meal supplement toxin? Was it what? Whatever. I just I just deleted my notes. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> That's, no that was um, my favorite sketch of the night. Nutrific. Nutrific. Uh, I thought Jane was really good. Everybody was really good in it, and it was ridiculous and crazy. And My best of the night, I mean, yeah, Garrett singing at the beginning. Uh, I don't know. Apparently some people got annoyed with how much Garrett got to sing over the years. I don't know. I just I loved it. I laughed through the whole thing. And really, it's a, it's a beautifully, beautiful song done beautifully well and still hilarious. So it's working for me. But uh, Nutrifix, Blurry, and Sybil 2 or Sybil 3 were all up there as well. Star of the night, Matt. I guess I'm going to go with Jane Curtin. I thought she was great in Weekend Update. I thought she was great as the uh, the modern woman. Really recognized her tonight. And she did another First Lady, which was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't really think there was a particular, there wasn't a particular standout for me tonight. So I had to like do the math about whose performance I enjoyed the most versus how they were on the screen. And I always like her. She's always my favorite conehead too. So, yep. I, I also went with Jane for all the reasons you stated. So overall, like 
Jill Clayberg's first episode. I don't think this is going to be a memorable one for us, but that also means it's not so terrible that it's on our memorable scale. The best for me, Garrett, uh, Sybil, Nutrafix, they were really kind of devoid of like your stock characters or, or impressions. These were sort of all one-offs. We got a weak Coneheads, an average Olympia Cafe, and a shower mic that wasn't as good as the one I saw before. And it started to make me wonder if they're already starting to lay a little too heavily on the on the stock characters. People are getting their their quick rush, like their sugar rush from these, recognizing the the Roseanne Rosanna Danas, um, and and giving them a big pop out of recognition. But you know, after a few seconds, they're thinking, okay, it's time for something new. So it's sort of saying like maybe let's slow down on the uh, the stock characters and, and and try an episode or two of just these one offs and see what works. That all being said, this was a good enough episode to keep me well above average. So I wound up giving this one a 7 out of 10. This was certainly an above average episode. Uh, I mean, I, I, at the baseline, I like the host, I like the music. Those are the two things that change every week, and those are the two things I liked about this. I do appreciate how she, they, she uh, Jill, that is, was used as a cast member. Eddie Money had good energy. Weekend Update was still pretty ho-hum. Uh, I'd rather Gilda do Roseanne, Rosanna, Dana than friggin that old lady again yeah jane had a, a good show yeah whatever it was an above average show i gave it a six out of ten very good so i can't give you the average yet but i'm going to throw to our uh our guest third chair who's going to fill in tonight and uh let's hear what they have to say about the show right now it's our voice of generation z hello daniel how are you i'm doing well thank you keith now you were last with us for miskel spillman yes i was yeah and uh, you've recovered from that episode? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you watched this Jill Clayberg episode with us and um, Eddie Money, of course. Just go through some quick things. Overall, what did you think of the episode? Certain stuff like Coneheads are really good, but there's also some bad stuff. All right, so let's rate the host. What did you think of Jill uh, Clayberg as a host? Jill Clayberg was okay. Her monologue was terrible. Other than that, she was okay. I'll did you like Eddie Money? Eddie Money was really good, in my opinion. I liked the whole atmosphere of it. I might listen to him on my own time. The other, uh, the other act from that period of time was that you've covered is Elvis Costello. Yeah. Um, do you prefer one of the two, Eddie, Mur- Eddie Money or Elvis Costello? I think I prefer Elvis Costello, but just by tiny bit. So, Dan, what is the worst sketch of the night? This doesn't really count as a sketch, but the monologue. Monologue was literally an empty burger. Nothing was in it. Basically just said, yeah, I'll be back next time. Yeah. Bye-bye. And no, we count them as, really, we say sketch, but it's any comedic piece of the night, and and the monologue fell flat for you. Yeah. It certainly did for, for Matt and I as well. What was the best of the night? Best of the night was probably Coneheads or Week Weekend update. Really? Okay, those were two that I didn't like so much. So who was your star of the night? I think my star of the night goes to Aykroyd. Everything he was in was really funny, in my opinion. So overall, Dan, how would you rate this episode out of ten? This this episode is, it had high highs and low lows. I'll give this one a seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. That's pretty good. So with my seven, Matt's six, and your seven... It winds up with a 6.7, which is not too bad for us. It falls just below the IMDb score of 6.8, so we're much closer to them than we usually are. The folks over at the IMDb rank this as the 18th episode out of 20, which is uh, mighty low for me. And number 423 of all episodes to date, so uh, that's awfully low. I really enjoyed this one, as did you and as did Matt, really. Yeah. Well, Dan, thank you very much for your time. We'll have you back again down the line. All right. Thank you. And now back to Matt and me. Yeah, Matt, it's it's fun for the two of us to be together in this, uh, this situation. Um, I hope you're happy with the results that we've gotten from our mystery third chair. Always a pleasure, and I look forward to it. Matt, you know who's hosting next week? I do. Christopher Lee. And the musical guest? Oh, I forget. Meatloaf. Meatloaf. How do you feel about that combination? Curious. I want to hear Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, and I'm not going to. So I'm setting myself up for disappointment. And I also heard Christopher Lee was a dick about doing Dracula stuff. Uh, so no, I, he wasn't, I, I, no. I have was, to clarify, because this has always been clarified by people who have said this. He wasn't a dick about it. He just he didn't want to do it. He made it clear that he just wasn't going to do Dracula. 
Um, he was very polite and nice about it. <laughs> okay. Of course he was. He's killed yeah. Nazis. But I'll let the episode stand on its own. Uh, I am looking forward to it. I do really like Christopher Lee. Where do you sit on Meatloaf? I don't care for Meatloaf. Oh, really? Okay. See, I'm a fan. Yeah, that's going to be interesting then. So Matt and I will be back in about a week. But until then, we'll be looking to buy two tickets to paradise here in SNL. <laughs>